with Clement also. And uh, the true and, my, and, and, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious of nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God that surpasses human understanding shall keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And now last Sunday we looked at the peace robbers. The peace robbers, and there are three, war among us, war inside us, and war above us. James chapter 4, verse 1 to 7. James 4, verse 1 to 7. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desire for pleasure? You last, you, you last and do not have. You murder and convert and cannot obtain. You fight and war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. And when you ask, you don't receive because you ask amiss. You adulterers and adulteresses. Don't you know that friendship with the world is an enmity with God? Therefore, whoever makes himself a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the spirit who dwells in you yearns jealously? Therefore, he says, he gives more grace to the humble. Therefore, he says, he resists the proud, the proud and gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and is going to flee from you. Verse 8, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded, and draw near to God. Amen. So today we look at the last one, and the last one is, uh, we are tightening it, the Prince of Peace. Uh, the Prince of Peace, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. Isaiah 9, verse 6 and and verse 7, the prince of peace, the prince of peace. This creature mostly we use it for Christmas. So it says uh, Isaiah 9 verse 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts we perform this. Amen. The Prince of Peace. It finishes by saying the, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So, in other words, it is a done deal. This will happen. You like it or not, this is going to happen because the Lord will perform it. Now, the United Nations was started immediately after Second World War. Initially, it was called the League of Nations. Then it was changed to United Nations. The purpose, the goal of United Nations is to end world war and to see or to establish peace in the world. Unfortunately, they have never succeeded. They have never, they have miserably prevailed, uh, failed because there is no time, there is no year that the world was in total peace, that the world was in perfect peace. It has never happened. There is always fight after fight. Today, our immediate former president, we all know, was appointed to negotiate on behalf of Tigris and Ethiopia. There is war all over the countries, despite of having the United Nations in place. But imagine with me for a moment 
the world without war. Totally. Imagine with me the world with total perfect peace. Meaning, there is no need for security, there is no need for police. You know, that is when all politicians will become saints that day. You know, that is when the animals will be tamed. You don't have to be afraid to mingle and to join up with the, with the, with the animals. But until then, the world doesn't know peace. Now, that time, it will happen. But it will only happen when the prince of peace comes into this world. And it is called the millennium. It is called the kingdom age. The kingdom age. Isaiah, he was able to see beyond his own life. He was able to see beyond Bethlehem. He was able to see beyond the cross of Calvary. He was able to see beyond the resurrection of Jesus. And he saw that there is coming a time when Jesus will come back. And there will be that perfect peace in the world. When the Lord God, who knows everything, who is benevolent, when, who is compassionate, when he will establish his rule on this world. Now, we are reading there in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. And I want to pick three reasons from Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7 that will make that rule of the prince of peace be successful. How will he establish that peace here on earth? And it will be successful. Three things that I want to mention around the prince of peace. Number one, the king himself. The king, number one. We look at the king during that period when there will be that perfect peace. When the prince of peace will be ruling in this world. We look at number one, the king himself. And the Bible says there in verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders. But mentioning about the king and looking at the king, there are three things we can see about this king. And number one is the humanity of this king. The humanity of this king. It says, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a child is born. The same child will also be called mighty God as we continue. Now, how do you reconcile God being born? Because we are told a child is born. Yet, this child is mighty God. The only way you can understand or bring them together is understanding the, another prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah 7 verse 14. Isaiah 7 14 where he says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. A virgin shall be with a child. And his name shall be called Emmanuel. Now, this is a miracle. This is not normal birth. A virgin shall be with a child. That is the only explanation that can help us understand how God can be born. An angel came to Mary, Luke 1, verse 34 and 35, and said, you shall be with a child. And she said, how can this thing be? Seeing I am a virgin, I don't know a man. And God said, the power of the highest, verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And you will be overshadowed by the power of God. And that which shall be born shall be called the Son of God. So, the humanity of Jesus, yes, is total God. But here on earth, he was total man. There is no way he could save you and save me as God. He had to be like you. He had to be like me. He had to experience what we experience. When, when Adam and Eve sinned, God made the first messianic promise in Genesis 3.15. And God said to the serpent, I shall put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman. 
between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And God said, uh, when the seed of the woman, we know women have no seed. Women have no seed. Seed is, is carried by a man. But God said, uh, in this supernatural salvation, a woman shall bring forth a seed. And that seed is going to crush the head of the serpent. As a serpent will crush the heel. In other words, what I'm underscoring is uh, that Jesus, in that miracle, but, uh, he was not just God, he was also human. And he had to be born who human for, you, for him to save you and to save me. John chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. John 10, verse 1 and 2. The Bible says that he who comes by any other way, most assuredly I said to he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but, I'm, but comes by some other way. The same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now the door, the door there speaks of a woman. Anybody who didn't come through a woman into this world is a thief. For you to come into this world, you must come through a woman. That is why when you go to verse 10 of the same chapter, it says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you may have life and life in abundance. The only person without a birth certificate is the devil. Praise the Lord. In other words, the only person who was not born is the devil. And he's a thief. But even Jesus, as the good shepherd, he had to be born. He had to come through a woman. But when you go to verse 9, now he says, I am the door. He, he came through the door, but after coming through a woman, he paid the price for our sin and now became the door. That when you come through Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. You can live forever. You can join in the kingdom of God. So number one, the humanity of Jesus unto us, a child is born. Number two, the deity of Jesus. We are looking at the king. We are still at part one. The king. So A, A, the humanity. B, B, the, the deity. The deity of this king. And to us, a child is born. And to us, a son is given. And to us, a child is born. A ch the child Jesus was born. The son Jesus was given. So when the child was born, God gave the son. The child was born. But when the child was being born, God gave the son. That is the meaning of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus is the only person who existed before he was born. He's the only person. His Jesus is the only person who existed before he was born. The, right here we see the pre-existence of Jesus Christ before his birth. Amen? And that is what Paul means when he writes to his son Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. And he says, for without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Without argument. There is no other argument. Hallelujah. For without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. That God was manifested in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit. He was seen by angels. He was preached among the Gentiles. He was believed in the world. And he was received into glory. The full gospel. The full story about Jesus Christ. So, number one, the king. A, his humanity. B, his deity. C, his sovereignty. C, his sovereignty about this king. And to us, a child is born. Humanity. And to us, a son is given. Deity. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. The government shall be upon his shoulders. When the prince of peace comes, when King Jesus comes, he shall rule and the government shall be upon his shoulders and he's going to rule forever. You cannot impeach him. If you don't like his rule, 
You cannot vote him out. You can't. He has no term limit. If you, if you don't like him, you can't say, next, in the next elections, I'll, I will not vote for him. The government shall be upon his shoulders. Now, upon his shoulders, it means that him as the king and as the Lord, he shall bear the burden. He shall bear the weight. In ancient days, in ancient days, the kings, they would bear the burdens of the nation. And they would, that is why they would, they would wear those heavy robes, heavy robes, as a symbol that they are bearing the burden of the nation. It's unfortunate that today we have leaders who put burdens on people. The Bible kind of leadership is you take the burden off the people and you pick it upon yourself. A story is told of a certain king in his rule twice in a year, twice in a year, he would remove his royal clothes and he would mingle with the other persons, with other poor people. He would remove his clothes, he would go to the slums, he would go to people, common people, and live with them for some time. Now, he would be warned, he would be told that is a security issue. It's a security threat. But his argument was, I can never know how these people are living unless I live among them. Exactly what Jesus did in Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 to verse 8. Uh, the Bible says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking upon himself the form of a servant, and being found as a servant, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Theologically, it's called kenosis. Kenosis means uh, he emptied himself. For Jesus to come into this world, he had to put a Aside is God, the glories of God, and became like you and me. And that is why, that is why in verse 9 and verse 10, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things on earth, things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because he lived among us, he's become the king of kings and the lord of lords he is sovereign he is worthy of ruler he is worthy of reign amen number two so number one the king number two the king's name number two the king's name and to us a child is born and to us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulders his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now we are given the names of this king. Four of them. Some versions give five. Like my version gives five. But originally there is no comma between Wonderful and Counselor. There is no comma. Wonderful, it's an adjective it's an adjective of that counselor. It's a description of that counselor. So, his name, now the name given to him is not the name to call him, for example, just to call him Chris so that he can get his attention. No. It's a description of his characteristics. It is a, it's the explanation, the description of his nature. The name of his king. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful Counselor. Meaning that he shall say the right things. It means uh, that his counsel is a wonder. When he gives you counsel, it is a wonder. Anybody can give counseling. Anybody can give his or her opinion. But not everybody can give wonderful opinion. Not everybody can give wonderful counsel. But this Jesus, the Prince of Peace, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. 
They said of him in Matthew 7 verse 28 and verse 29. Matthew 7 verse 28 and verse 29. They said and it came to pass. When Jesus had ended these sayings. The people were amazed. For he taught them not as the scribes. Not as the Pharisees. His authority. The way he spoke. The way he would give his wisdom. The way he would give his counsel. It was not like the scribes. The teachers of the law in those days. At another time they said in John chapter 7. They said no man speaks like this man. When he speaks. His wisdom transcends every human wisdom. His wisdom supersedes the wisdom of the people of this world. He's a wonderful counselor. I pray that we who are in leadership, whether it is in the house or in the office or out there, that we shall seek God for wisdom. That we shall consult the Bible because Jesus is the wonderful counselor. Number two, number B, A, wonderful counselor. A, wonderful counselor. B of his name, mighty God. Mighty God. The name of this king is wonderful counselor. He gives counsel that is great. Number two, he is mighty God. He is mighty God. In other words, this Jesus, he doesn't just tell you the right things to do. He doesn't ju just tell you good things to do. He doesn't just give you wonderful counsel. After he has told you what to do, he gives you the power to do the right things. He is mighty God. He is wonderful counselor, but also mighty God. That is what makes Christianity different from every other religion. Other religions, the Buddha, Muhammad, all other religions, they will tell you how to live. They will tell you the nice things you want, you need to do. But they will never give you the power to do those right things. But Jesus said to his followers in Acts 1 verse 8 Acts 1 verse 8, Jesus said to his followers, don't go don't leave Jerusalem but wait until you are filled with the Holy Spirit then you shall receive power. You shall receive power to be my representative. You shall receive power to carry out the work that I have begun. So he's mighty God. Wonderful counselor, number one. Mighty God. Number three, everlasting father. This prince of peace, he is everlasting father. Now, everlasting father, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that he's God the father. There is a difference. There is a difference between everlasting father and God the father. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is the third. The Father is the first person of the Trinity. But the idea, when the Bible says uh, everlasting Father, the idea is uh, that he will rule as a father. He will rule with paternity. He will be a patriarch. He will be like a father. In his way of rule and reigning, in the millennium, when there shall be perfect peace, he shall rule as a father. That's the idea. You know, there's a theology, there's a, there's, a, there's a theology, it's called modalism. Modalism says, modalism says, there is one God, one person. One God, one person. We in Christianity, we believe in the Trinity, that there is one God in three persons. Mod mod modalism says there is one God, one person, so that this one God, this one God, at times he can show forth as a father, other times he can show forth as a son, other times he can show forth as a Holy Spirit. But it is one person. We believe in three persons. There is God the Holy Spirit, God the Son, and God the Father. So Jesus as everlasting Father, it means he will love us as a father. Psalm 103, verse 13 and 14. Psalm 103, verse 13 and 14. The Bible says, uh, the Bible says uh, he knows our frame. Psalm 103. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. Because he knows our frame. He knows we are made of dust. So he loves you 
as an everlasting father. Number four, the prince of peace. Number four, the names of the king. The names of the king, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father. His name shall be called the prince of peace. Amen. The prince of peace. In other words, when he comes, there shall be perfect peace. There shall be total peace. I know today, the question would be, when, when angels appeared after Jesus was born, this is what they announced. Glory to God in the heavens. Luke chapter 2 verse 14. When Jesus was born, angels announced to the shepherds, glory to God in the highest. Goodwill and peace toward men. Goodwill and peace toward men. The coming of Jesus meant, the coming of Jesus meant peace toward men. It meant peace to you. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor peace to you. The coming of Jesus meant glory to God in the highest, goodwill toward men, and peace to all men. The problem is, now it has been 2,000 years, and there is no peace in the world. The correct interpretation of that verse from the Greek, the correct interpretation of that verse is, glory to God in the highest, goodwill and peace towards all men, on whom God's favor rests. Let me repeat that again. Glory to God in the highest. Goodwill and peace towards all men on whom God's favor rests. So when Jesus came, he came to bring peace. But that peace is only enjoyed and found on those whose God's favor rests. And there are three kinds of peace that Jesus brought. Three kinds of peace. Number one, peace with God. And we discussed about that. Peace with God. Romans 5 verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. When you are born again, you receive peace with God. After you are born again, you graduate to the second level of peace. It's called the peace of God. The peace of God. Philippians 4 verse 6. Be anxious of nothing but everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. Verse 7. And the peace of God. The peace of God. That surpasses human understanding. Shall keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. The peace of God. Now I have peace with God. After I have peace with God. I'm born again. I'm a Christian. I can pray in whatever situation. And I can enjoy the peace of God. In my mind. And my heart. Then number three level of peace. Is peace from God. Peace from God. Peace with God. Peace of God. And number three, there is peace from God. Matthew 6 verse 10. Matthew 6 verse 10. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There is coming a time when the prince of peace comes back in his second coming. The kingdom of God and the will of God as it is in heaven shall be established here on earth. There will be perfect So there's another level that is coming for we who are now we have peace with God and we also have the peace of God. We are in this world the world that doesn't know peace but for you and me we are in total peace because the favor of God rests upon us. But there's coming a time when now the peace will be established in the whole world. It is called peace from God when the prince of peace in his second coming. Amen. So number one, the king. Number two, the king's name. Wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting for the prince of peace. Number four, number three, sorry. Number three, the kingdom. The king, number three, the kingdom. Verse seven, Isaiah nine, verse seven. 
of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Hallelujah. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. When Jesus, the Prince of Peace, comes, there will be perfect peace. But now the question is, the question is, how is there perfect peace? And then the Bible says, it will be expanding. And it will be increasing. We have, we have perfect peace. We have total peace. How do, how do total peace increase? How do total peace expand? You need to understand that when the Prince of Peace comes, to rule for a thousand years we will be coming the world will be coming from tribulation the world will be coming from tribulation so the devil is arrested and locked for a thousand years so we have peace in this world but because of where we are coming that idea of the peace of God will continue to increase in you and to increase in me. Well, from where you are coming and now you begin to study the peace of God, it will continue to increase and increase. And increase. Number two, not just that. But the other point is because there are people, you and me, we will be born, we, who are born again, we will come back with Jesus with glorified bodies. But there are people here who will be in this world and are not born again. They are not born again. They have their normal human body. Me and you, we have glorified bodies. But then, they are not born again. And they will begin to remember the gospel that was preached. And there are those who will be born again in that period of the millennium. So, the fact that there are people who will be getting saved, the peace of God will be spreading. You didn't have peace, but now you're born again. The peace of God. That peace, it increases, it reaches in your heart. The kingdom, that millennium kingdom, will have some characteristics. Isaiah 11 verse 6 to 9. Isaiah 11, 6 to 9. We are told this how it shall be, that kingdom. Animals will be tamed. Animals will be tamed. Amen. A wolf will lie down with a lamb. A leopard with a goat. A calf with a young lion. A young child will be playing with a snake. Animals will be tamed. Today, if you visit animals, you make sure that they are on that side and you're on this side. You don't risk to mingle with them. But a time is coming when the Prince of Peace comes into this world, animals will be tamed. Amen? The environment will be perfect. Isaiah 35, verse 1, verse 2, and verse 6. Isaiah 35, Isaiah 35, verse 1 and 2 and 6. The Bible says, The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose, verse 2. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The excellence of Camel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God, verse 6. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the dump shall sing for water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. In other words, there shall be a recreation during the millennium. Nature shall celebrate the coming of the Prince of Peace. Amen? Hallelujah. The third thing with this kingdom, when the Prince of Peace comes, oh, there will be human longevity. There will be the lifespan. The lifespan of hum, human lifespan will increase. Hum, human lifespan is going to increase. People will live for long, for a thousand years. Bible says, when the Prince of Peace comes, when the Prince of Peace comes, people will live for very long. Isaiah 65 verse 20 says, 
When somebody dies at a hundred years, we will say he has died an infant at a hundred. At a hundred. We will say he has died a child. Because people will live for long. Let me tell you. It is believed before the floods, before the floods in the days of Noah, there was a vapor canopy that was a vapor canopy that was in the sky, in the clouds. And it prevented radiation. It prevented radiation. That is why somebody like Methuselah, Methuselah lived for how many years? Let me see if I have Bible students here. How many years? 969 years, Methuselah. The reason why people lived long, the reason why people lived long is because they were not burnt directly by the sun. There was that canopy. Before, from, from the time Adam was created to the time of Adam, to the time of Noah, sorry, to the time of Noah, people used to plant or to do farming using mists. Water was coming from the ground. So it, it had never rained from above. The day it rained with the floods, that canopy was broken. And humanity became exposed to the sun. You read your Bible. The floods are in Genesis chapter 6. Immediately after the flood, the years drop from 900 to 100. Immediately. Immediately after the floods, the years drop. Immediately. Why? Because people became exposed to the sun. And since then, years have continued to reduce. So that now, we are told in Psalm 90 verse 10, Psalm 90 verse 10, the years of a man are 70. And by reason of strength, they stretch to 80. Yet, <laughs> praise the Lord. Yet, after 70, they are full of what? <laughs> Sorrow and labor. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, you can, we can never compare with Adam who lived 930. We can't compare with Noah or with Methuselah. The years of human beings dropped drastically. But good news, when the Prince of Peace comes back, there shall be a restoration of those years. Whatever shall happen, there shall be a restoration of that canopy so that immediately the Prince of Peace comes back, people will live to those a thousand years again. So that somebody dies at a hundred, it is said he has died an infant. But I think for us today, think of it as I finish, do you have peace with God? And you have peace with God. If you are born again, you can enjoy the peace of God. We just pray. We just surrender. We cast our cares to God. For he cares for us. Let me have the worship team here. We cast our cares to God. For he cares for us. We don't need to be. We don't need to have a troubled heart. Or a troubled mind. As a child of God. Your world may not have peace. Your environment may not have peace. But you. You. The favor of God rests upon you. And the prince of peace is in your heart. So if the Prince of Peace is in your heart, he shall rule with peace. Even as we look forward to one day when peace will come from God and be established in this physical world. Let's be on our feet. The King, the humanity of Jesus, the deity of Jesus, the sovereignty of Jesus, his humanity, and to us a child is born. He, he put on humanity so that he can experience what you experience. He got tired. Even as we get tired. He got hungry. Even as at times we get hungry. Yes he was. We know he went to a tree looking for a fruit because he was hungry. We know in the boat he slept at the back of that boat on a pillow. 
Because he was human. Ultimately, he suffered and died in his humanity. But also he was deity. Yes, he was humanity. Also he was deity. Amen. People who argue with us, particularly from other religions, they will tell you, if Jesus was God, does God get hungry? If Jesus was God, and you are claiming Jesus to be God, does God sleep? We tell them, we tell them, Jesus, in his humanity, he slept. But in his deity, in his deity, when they woke him up, he calmed the storm. And he calmed the wind. You can't do that in humanity. It was now the God side working. When he was hungry, when he was hungry, he was human. But when he cast the tree and it dried immediately, that was the deity part of God. Amen. Let's let's have a worship. Come on. 